So in cardiology papers, I have often seen them asking land CC sign is seen in which of the following condition, right? So tricuspid regurgitation. Okay. Subscribe and press the bell icon so you never miss an update from Prep Ladder. Hi guys, this is Dr. Patil, your medicine educator for prep ladder neat assess. Now, at prep ladder neat assess, we have got probably the most extensive coverage of medicine as a syllabus for the upcoming neat assess examination. Like unlike our the other platform that exists, which are catering to the neat assess, we have covered those segments of medicine which are often ignored by other platforms, and end result is even students end up ignoring. For example, infectious diseases, genetics. Critical care medicine. There are so many segments of medicine which are generally ignored, right? So medicine is not almost always about your cardiology, neurology, nephrology, and gastroenterology. There is medicine beyond that. And neat assess exam generally focuses on those beyond topics, right? So you hear questions from geriatrics, you get questions from critical care medicine, you do get questions from infectious diseases, substantial weightage, right? So we have covered all those ignored segments. So if you are someone who is preparing for neat assess, I would definitely recommend you to try out prep ladder. Okay. So now let me take you through some of the important MCQs. This is the first MCQ that I am projecting. Fused CV waves on JVP is seen in which of the following condition? Tricuspid stenosis, tricuspid regurgitation, constrictive pericarditis and aortic regurgitation. So what is the right answer? Right. So understanding the JVP is of paramount importance. I have seen plenty of MCQs on the need super specialty and other uh, super specialty entrance exams from JVP. Starting from the DNB days, I have, keen, I have been seeing so many MCQs on this. Right. Okay, so we all understand the basics of JVP. The first positive upstroke on the JVP, the A wave is caused by the atrial systole contraction of the right atrium. So when the right atrium is contracting, the pressure is transmitted to the superior vena cava. That's why we see the first positive upstroke, that is A wave. So that is typical. Atrium is contracting, the pressure is reflected onto the JVP, so you get a first positive wave. Now, once the atria start relaxing after the contraction, when the atrial diastole starts occurring, right? So pressure inside the right atrial chamber starts dropping because the atria is now relaxing. So then we start seeing a descent, right? So we have a positive upstroke A wave due to atrial contraction and then there is a descent which is generally called as, broadly speaking, it's called as X descent, right? Very easy to remember. X stands for relaxation. Atrial relaxation causes X descent. But this X descent is further divided into two segments. So we can call it as X and X test descent. Why are we dividing it into two segments? Because we see one positive C wave in between this uh, atrial relaxation phase, right? Why this C wave is occurring? The C wave is occurring because when the atria is going through diastole, your ventricle, the right ventricle is going through the systole, right? So once the atria is relaxing, the right ventricle is contracting. So this right ventricular contraction, right? What is the usual outlet of the right ventricle? Your pulmonary artery. So when the right ventricle is contracting to put the blood into pulmonary artery, the pressure is also reflected onto your fused or your closed tricuspid valve, right? The tricuspid valve is closed now, but the pressure is also delivered to that. So the tricuspid valve bulges into your right atria. So this bulge is what gives rise to your C wave, right? Again, easy to remember C for cusp bulge, right? tricuspid bulge into right atrium. So that gives one positive upstroke. Right. Beyond that, again, the atria continues to relax. So we have this X dash descent. So we have X and X dash descent. Right. So after that, once you have reached the X dash descent, then you will start seeing another positive upstroke. This positive upstroke is because of the filling of the right atrium from the veins, right? superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, venous filling. Easy to remember, V for venous filling right now the right atrium starts receiving blood from the veins and the pressure inside the right atrium starts building up because of the blood coming in so that gives rise to a positive v wave okay now when this cv wave will get fused so cv wave will get fused when your x descent is impaired or x descent is lost right particularly the x dash descent is lost so when that can occur okay let me tell you what happens when there is a tricuspid stenosis if there is a tricuspid stenosis right so when the right atrium is contracting it is encountering much more force it needs much more force because there is a very narrowed down tricuspid valve right so that means your a wave is going to become much more prominent giant a waves is what we see when there is a tricuspid stenosis what will happen when there is tricuspid regurgitation okay so when there is tricuspid regurgitation let us see what is happening in the ventricular systole so during the ventricular systole, the normal outlet for the blood is your pulmonary artery, right? So blood is supposed to go into pulmonary artery. But 
because there is regurgitation during the ventricular systole blood has two outlets one way it is going into pulmonary artery but it is also getting jetted into your right atrium right so which phase of the right atrial cycle this is happening it is during the relaxation right so during the right atrial relaxation or in other words it is the atrial diastole where the ventricle is roughly in systole so during atrial diastole the relaxation phase where the x descent is occurring the blood from right ventricle is getting gushed into your right atrium so that gives rise to a positive pressure build up right so you get a c wave because once the it systole is starting ventricular systole is start, starting obviously there will be this c wave coming because the tricuspid valve is now pushed into right atrium but because it is regurgitant right blood will continue to escape into right atrium and this positive wave is sustained so the c wave is sustained to reach your v wave so fused cv wave is seen in patients with tricuspid regurgitation right so what's the right answer for this question the right answer for this question is tricuspid regurgitation right you have to also remember this sign is also known as lancc sign right so this fused cv wave is also known as lancc sign so in cardiology papers i have often seen them asking lancc sign is seen in which of the following condition right so tricuspid regurgitation okay so let's go to the next question which of the following is not associated with rem behavioral sleep right options are parkinson's disease progressive supranuclear palsy multi system atrophy and diffuse levy body dementia okay so the two things to address here first is what is rem behavioral disorder and then in which conditions it is seen rem behavioral disorder is a, a type of sleep disorder where patients start enacting their dreams normally we experience dream when we are in the rem sleep phase right we do not put those uh, dreams into action because of the profound hypotonia that we experience during sleep but some conditions where the tone is sustained in hypotonic phase during sleep patients might start enacting their dreams because the hypotonia is not prohibiting the movements from being carried out right so this is what we call as rem behavioral disorder right where do we see it rem behavioral disorder is a characteristic finding of what we call as alpha synucleopathies alpha synucleopathies right that is a typical finding of alpha synucleopathies so what are the alpha synucleopathies that we are seeing here parkinson's disease is an alpha synucleopathy msa is an alpha synucleopathy and diffuse levy body dementia is an alpha synucleopathy so it is the progressive supranuclear palsy which is a tau pathy so that becomes our right answer in this case right so your parkinson's disease msa and dlb are considered as synucleopathies progressive supranuclear palsy cortico basal degeneration fronto temporal dementia and alzheimer's disease are tau pathies alzheimer's disease where even amyloid deposition occurs so it can also be considered as an amyloidopathy right so these neurodegenerative disorders and the kind of protein that is accumulated in them is another important mcq area right okay let's go to the next question now most common sleep abnormality in patients with parkinson's disease or this question can be modified and they might ask what is the most common sleep abnormality in patients with synucleopathies well now i know you may be thinking option c is the right answer rem behavioral sleep disorder but no yes that is characteristic but that is not the most common the most common is insomnia right so this is another point i want you to note parkinson's this is most common sleep abnormality is insomnia okay let's go to next question now patient presented with hemiparesis with lower limb severely affected when compared to upper limb cranial deficits are not there cranial nerve deficits are not there what is the most likely culprit vessel okay so point number 1 it's it looks like a case of stroke so let us try to localize is it a disorder of the spinal cord absolutely no there is no horizontal level of sensory loss they are not describing it and patient is not having quadriparesis or uh, or paraparesis right so he is having a hemiparesis clearly so when there is hemiparesis the site of lesion will be either brain stem subcortical structure or cortical structures right is it a brain stem lesion definitely no because there are no cranial nerve deficit it's not a case of crossed hemiplegia right so it is either subcortical or cortical now we clearly know the distribution of weakness right lower limb is much more severely affected than upper limb so can we guess the artery based on this yes we can easily do that because we are aware of this motor homunculus and sensory homunculus right so this is the motor homunculus and if you look at the motor homunculus you will clearly notice that the medial surface of your motor cortex right is where your lower limb is being represented and on the superior lateral surface is where your face and your upper extremity upper extremity is usually represented right so this medial surface is the one that receives the blood supply from anterior cerebral artery and it is a superior lateral surface that gets the blood supply from your middle cerebral artery right so a lesion of middle cerebral artery will manifest with profound upper limb and face weakness 
in comparison to lower limb weakness and an ACA lesion will present with profound lower limb weakness in comparison to upper limb or face right this you can easily see from the motor homunculus itself so now going back to the question the question is specifically asking which artery lower limb is more affected right so in this question lower limb is more affected than upper limb so obviously we are talking about ACA territory lesions right ACA territory lesion and that becomes our right answer clear now let's go to next question question number four patient presented with idiomotor apraxia or idiomotor apraxia what is the most likely site of lesion okay so to answer this question the the question is not very precise in, in the sense they are just asking you to localize to the lobe not to the precise location right okay so in that case we should know what are the typical findings of a frontal lobe lesion what are the typical findings of a parietal lobe lesion occipital lobe lesion cerebellar lesion cingulus cortex lesion right okay now what are the important structures with that we encounter in the frontal lobe or functional areas we have the motor cortex in the frontal lobe right then we have this premotor area premotor cortex right then we have this prefrontal cortex right now if there is a prefrontal cortex lesion that would probably present with behavioral changes that would be an important clue right behavioral changes now if it is a premotor area com complex maybe i will see primitive reflexes primitive reflexes and there may be severe truncal uh, rigidity the truncal muscles are much more profoundly represented in the premotor area than the motor area in the motor area is where our uh, extra axial muscles are are well represented right so motor area typically would present with your classical umn hemiparesis right okay and apart from this frontal lobe has broca's area so there may be broca's aphasia present right so these are the pointers to localize the site of lesion to frontal lobe now what are the important structures we have in parietal lobe so when we talk about parietal lobe generally we talk about sensory cortex sensory cortex is present in the parietal lobe right so a sensory cortex lesion might present with loss of cortical sensations yeah beyond that we should also be aware about the non dominant parietal lobe lesions right now talking about the dominant loss of cortical sensations right loss of cortical sensations is what we would be seeing just behind the parietal lobe we also have this supramarginal gyrus right which is concerned with praxis praxis is what what is praxis praxis is our ability to execute learned skilled movements so motor skilled movements which we have already learned we will be able to execute that subconsciously that's what we call as praxis apraxia means failure to execute that right failure to execute a skilled movement which you have already learned right so basic skilled movement like picking up an object from something right so those are all basic skilled movements which you have already learned right so loss of that is what is seen when the supramarginal gyrus is affected so idiomotor apraxia and ideational apraxia are due to supramarginal gyrus lesions right supramarginal gyrus lesions which is part of parietal lobe so that's why the right answer here is option a clear okay so this is where our sensory cortex is located that is our broadman area right 1 2 and 3 right so just anterior to your central sulcus is where you see your motor cortex present right that is our broadman area 4 right so behind this sensory cortex this is a sensory cortex right this is the supramarginal gyrus supramarginal gyrus and a lesion of that can lead to motor apraxia right so just behind that we have this thing called as angular gyrus and this we are all familiar right so angular gyrus lesion leads to what we call as gerstmann syndrome gerstmann syndrome where patients present with a calculia difficulty calculation alexia difficulty in learning agraphia difficulty in writing right and left right agnosia and our characteristic finger agnosia these are the findings when there is a lesion affecting this angular gyrus clear okay so just going back to the question what is the right answer it's a parietal lobe lesion that can cause idiomotor apraxia cerebellum we know the classical cerebellar finding frontal lobe we just discussed about it the last one is cingulate cortex lesion yes yeah, cingulate cortex lesion can cause apathy abulia and your akinetic mutism right akinetic mutism the more of it i have already discussed in one of the ini ct recall discussion so you can go through that video okay now let's go to the next question 
what do we have in this question we have a 30 year old who presented with polyuria polyphagia and polydipsia a classical symptomatic diabetes is what we are thinking of a bs is 130 well that itself satisfies the diagnostic criteria of more than 126 hba1c seven percent so the diagnosis is established we are, ha we are having a case of diabetes mellitus on examination following sign was noted what is the most likely diagnosis so what do we see in this image we see acanthosis nigricans right acanthosis nigricans now what is acanthosis nigricans acanthosis nigricans is because of hyperproliferation of the uh, skin epithelium why the proliferation is occurring because of insulin stimulation so insulin is a growth promoting factor growth promoting factor just like our insulin like growth factor right it can act as a growth promoting factor so whenever we see acanthosis nigricans that means we are seeing a patient with hyperinsulinemia why hyperinsulinemia is occurring hyperinsulinemia is occurring because of insulin resistance right so acanthosis nigricans can be taken as a marker of insulin resistance so which of these uh, types of diabetes uh, will be associated with insulin resistance whenever insulin resistance comes into picture it's only type 2 right so we don't see insulin resistance in type 1 we don't see insulin resistance in lada we don't see insulin resistance in modi right so modi is because of a single genetic defect mostly concerned with the uh, glucose sensing or glucose release that's the insulin release right lada is nothing but kind of type 1 which is detected late slow progressing late presenting type 1 is what we generally describe lada as and type 1 is where there is absolute insulin deficiency no question of resistance right so all these three are not on the answer option b is the right answer t2dm is where you will be seeing insulin resistance hyperinsulinemia acanthosis nigricans okay let's go to the next question now patient presented with difficulty in walking on examination revealed weakness of bilateral quadriceps muscles cpk is normal no history of diabetes no history of statins muscle biopsy revealed rimmed vacuoles what is the diagnosis okay so there are a few clues to discuss here patient presented with difficulty wo walking and it revealed the bilateral quadriceps weakness okay now whenever you say quadriceps weakness the two things come to my mind one is your inclusion body myositis and the second thing is diabetic amyotrophy right so what you call as bruns garland syndrome so in this case the history of diabetes is not there so i would be strongly thinking of inclusion body myositis provided if i knew the age of the patient i would be more certain because inclusion body myositis is usually seen in elderly right so if they had mentioned that the patient is 50 years plus like 60 70 i would be more confident even then having the diabetes mellitus ruled out i would be still strongly thinking of inclusion body myositis only okay and the another clue here is cpk is normal generally when we talk about idiopathic inflammatory myositis we generally say that they are associated with profound increase in cpk level the highest increase in cpk level is seen in with seen with immune mediated necrotizing myositis or statin induced necrotizing myositis right and generally we say the least amount of cpk rise would be seen in inclusion body myositis right inclusion body myositis is often debated at a, as a degenerative uh, muscle disease rather than an inflammatory muscle disease because we don't have evidence of inflammation even on the biopsy right so this is like a misclassification is what some of us do argue right okay so whole thing fits into the picture now inclusion body myositis and the muscle biopsy revealed rimmed vacuoles yeah so when you stain it with gomori trichome stain you will be able to document inclusion bodies plus rimmed vacuoles so rimmed vacuoles is a important clue from the biopsy so keeping all this information together the right answer is option d which is inclusion body myositis right so there are few key points to note about inclusion body myositis unlike your dermatomyositis polymyositis or immune mediated necrotizing myositis in these patients there is no there is no invasion of the muscle fibers or the fascicles by inflammatory cells that's the first point second mostly when we talk about other muscle diseases the idiopathic inflammatory diseases generally we say they affect relatively young people like under 40 uh, fourth or fifth decade is the usual age of presentation but your inclusion body myositis presents much later it is typically seen in elderly population that is the second difference and the third difference is inclusion body myositis the cpk levels are usually not grossly elevated in all other cases significant elevation in cpk is usually seen right okay so yeah the one more point i forgot to tell you most of these uh, idiopathic inflammatory myositis females are more affected than males with an exception being ibm right so i, I call ibm as a man of exceptions ibm males are more affected than females okay age wise there is exception gender distribution wise there is exception this is behavior wise this is exception right okay let's go to the next question now so this is our seventh question a 46 year old female presented with 
known patient of rheumatoid arthritis she's, she's already on methotrexate so the logical right choice has been already started she is also on hydroxychloroquine and continues to experience high disease activity scores physician decides to add biologicals to prescribe which of the following drugs physician need to perform a ppd skin test okay so point number 1 is the patient being treated rightly yes so what guidelines recommend guidelines recommend that methotrexate is the drug of choice for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis when there is contraindication to methotrexate leflunomide can be used as an alternative right but the preferred agent is methotrexate if the disease activity is not controlled with methotrexate or the remission is not achieved right you might consider adding options with you are adding the conventional dmards right or adding your biologicals the choice depends on the disease severity and presence of certain risk factors so if there is early evidence of joint damage our patient is having extremely high disease activity scores despite already being initiated on methotrexate and in such cases we think of starting biologicals in this case patient was already on two drugs methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine and continues to experience high disease activity so this is the right time to think of the biologicals because it is the initial 2 to 4 years which is very important for us to have a good disease activity control because maximum deformity occurs during this period right so it is good that we should be considering biologicals in this case Right. So the question is, which of the following drug to prescribe? Which of the following drug physician needs to perform PPD skin test? Right. Okay. So we understand the role of TNF alpha, right? TNF alpha in suppression of Hep B infection, right? Hep B replication. So if you want to start TNF alpha anti TNF alpha drugs, right? Then you have to check their hepatitis B status because there may be reactivation, the chronic. Uh, carrier state might become reactivated after anti tnf alpha therapy similarly anti tnf alpha therapy is also associated with reactivation of tuberculosis right so for reactivation of tuberculosis there are two class of drugs i wanted to remember one is your anakinara and the second one is your uh, anti tnf alpha drugs right so whenever we think of prescribing anti tnf alpha drug we need to take a look at the patient's tb status the ppd skin test may be less relevant in india because it's like invariably kind of you see some kind of reaction in many patients with india in the western world yes it is considered as a very important tool to screen for tuberculosis in india there is a lot of clinical judgments need to be made okay so which drug is uh, anti tnf alpha drug here it is the golimumab which is a anti tnf alpha drug right so golimumab sertolizumab and then our infliximab right all these are anti tnf alpha drugs so for prescribing these drugs we need to understand the patients tb status and hbv status tb and hbv status so the right answer here is option a now this is the question number 8 anti centromere antibodies are most commonly associated with which of the following disorder options are diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis mixed connective tissue disorder crest syndrome and polymyositis right so i have a simple mnemonic for us to remember the antibodies that are seen in patients with systemic sclerosis so we classify systemic sclerosis into limited cutaneous and diffuse cutaneous right systemic sclerosis is divided into limited cutaneous and diffuse cutaneous the classical antibody that is seen in limited cutaneous is anti centromere anti centromere and the typical antibody that is seen in diffuse cutaneous is our anti dna topoisomerase 1 anti dna topo isomerase 1 right okay now where is the centromere located in a cell that centromere is a part of your chromosomes right so they are restricted when chromosome exists their centromere exists so they are restricted to the nucleus clear they have a limited presence in the cell when we talk about dna so presence of dna is not only not restricted only to the nucleus dna can be present as free dna outside the cell in the cytoplasm and dna can also be present in mitochondria so you can simply say dna is little diffusely distributed dna diffusely distributed so anti dna topoisomerase 1 is seen in diffuse cutaneous uh, systemic sclerosis and centromeres are limited to the chromosomes limited to the nucleus so they are seen in limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis right okay so coming back to the question anti centromere is what they are asking so they are seen in limited cutaneous right so what is limited cutaneous here crest syndrome is the limited cutaneous one right so that's the right answer option c is the right answer okay so let's move to question number 9 most commonly used strain for mumps vaccine is 
I think I have been already telling that infectious diseases are going to be very important topic for the upcoming ETSS examination and uh, this is also the most neglected topic, right? Okay, so this question is about mumps and it is about vaccine. They are asking what is the most commonly used strain for development of vaccine. What are the options? Edmundston, Zagreb, El Zagreb, Zarillin and Urebe strain, right? Strain, okay. So Edmundston, Zagreb is usually the strain used for development of measles vaccine the remaining ones are used for development of mumps vaccine these are the mumps virus strains right among these the most common one is the larin lin strain strain sorry this is the one that is most commonly used for mumps vaccine development there are some vaccines which use urabe strain there are vaccines which use el zagreb but the most commonly used one or the standard one is jerry lin strain right so the right answer is option c okay so that brings me to the last question for the day the last question is most common presentation of Nipah virus infection is upper respiratory infection, acute febrile illness with rash, encephalitis and pneumonia. Okay, so point number one, Nipah virus belongs to which virus category, right? So Nipah virus belongs to what we call as paramyxoviridae, right? So it's a paramyxovirus, paramyxoviridae. So as a class, paramyxoviridae viridae is recognized for using the respiratory route as the route of entry or the, the route of infection, right? But need not all these viruses cause pneumonia or respiratory tract infection. So there are paramyxoviruses which cause respiratory tract infection that includes para-influenza, which usually causes common cold or sometimes in pediatric age group bronchiolitis or croup. And then we have this respiratory syncytial virus, which again typically in children causes the bronchiolitis, right? Okay, and then we have this mumps, which also belongs to paramyxoviridae. Then we have measles, which also belongs to paramyxoviridae. And then we have some closely related viruses called Nipha and Hendra, right? So among these, it is only para-influenza and RSV, which are respiratory pathogens. As I've already told you, all of them use the respiratory epithelium as their initial mode of entry. So they are spread through droplet. Sometimes they may be airborne. Right, that airborne versus not airborne is always a controversy for most viruses. So let us not get into that. But yeah, the route of spread is through the respiratory epithelium. But all of them do not cause respiratory illness. Some of them just use it as a portal of entry and after that they reach the lymph nodes. From there they reach the circulation, then they manifest elsewhere. Right. So the examples is mumps, measles. So it is not a primarily respiratory pathogen. Right. Similarly, Nipah and Hendra, right, these two viruses usually manifest as Though the mode of transmission is through the respiratory rate, they usually manifest in the form of encephalitis, right? So the right answer here is option C. Most common presentation of Nipah virus infection is encephalitis.